Uh, how about this? How about we don't allow a guy to bring up 15 to 20 bags over a three-day period into his hotel room? How about we have security at the service elevator that would at least escort somebody up? How about we train bellmans to say, you know what? This guy's brought up a lot of bags and they're really heavy. Maybe we need to have a security check. Maybe there would be an issue with a guy that post on his door do not disturb for multiple days in a row and nobody goes in to check his room or do a welfare check that might be an interesting thing because other hotels in vegas do that if you do a welfare check and you see something unusual you call security how long was that l bracket on the exit they don't know you know why they don't know is because they didn't have cameras in the hallway you know why they didn't want cameras in the hallway because they didn't want to be a part of divorces with subpoenaed records so that when a husband or a wife brings a prostitute into their room and then the records get subpoenaed, they didn't want to be a part of that anymore. They didn't want to see drug dealings occurring. They didn't want to see prostitutes walking in their hallways. They didn't want to be a part of criminal acts or investigations related to criminal acts. That would have been good information. When did he lock that door? It's supposed to be open 24-7, 365 days a year. There is absolutely no reason for an L bracket to be locked. And the only time they discovered that was when uh, they sent up the security guard to check on it just minutes before the shooting. That's completely inappropriate. If you're going to be oblivious to the safety of others, you should be held responsible. There are probably a hundred things that they could have done different and prevented this. If you put well, well if, do you also contend that that they should have done more knowing that there was this event going on that that you're in a, a extra high risk situation because you do have this event that's going on a hundred percent and 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 the law looks into that the law looks at foreseeability and if it's foreseeable in a normal circumstance cer certainly it's more foreseeable in a circumstance like this and a circumstance well, like this you're drawing a large number of people. A large number of people create an attraction for people that want to hurt people. So should you have a heightened sense of duty? And that's the question. Of course, you should have a heightened sense of duty. You should have done more on October 1st, 2017. Not the bare minimum. And they didn't even do the bare minimum, by the way. But they should have done more. Do you believe this? the, the court would determine that this event was foreseeable? Yeah, so in uh, Nevada, they have an interesting law, Jim, and, and it's different than most states. The court will decide foreseeability. Was it foreseeable for MGM, Mandalay Bay, Live Nation to uh, foresee or predict uh, active shooter? And some people say this, well, they couldn't predict it exactly. They couldn't predict it uh, closely, so how can you hold them responsibility, responsible? But that's not what the law says. The law in Nevada says, look, it's foreseeable if you could have predicted it at all. And recently, there was a Supreme Court decision in Nevada that came down that dealt with an assault on on a uh, premises there in Vegas. And the uh, and the defense was, look, we couldn't have predicted that this guy was going to attack this girl and drag her out of the hotel and rape her. And the court said, you know what? You could have predicted an assault, so you should have taken actions, and that's a legitimate claim. That was foreseeable. That's one of the new pieces of law that came back in uh, Nevada that has influenced me to dismiss my cases in California and bring them in Nevada. Uh, more importantly, this is a Nevada case with Nevada citizens and a Nevada company, and we ought to litigate it in Nevada so that they can take responsibility. I'm not trying to run from Las Vegas. I'm not trying to run from MGM, although it's the largest employer in Nevada and the largest political contributor in Nevada. I'm not running from them. I'll go to their hometown, and we'll try that case right there, and we'll see how they do with a jury of 12. We don't have to know that Mr. Paddock was a scumbag and a killer beforehand. What we have to know is there are scumbags and killers out there that want to hurt people, so we got to do something about all of them. So the what fact about the that, fact that he was a, a high roller? Do you think that had he not been a high roller and getting special treatment that perhaps he wouldn't have been able to do what he did, bringing that many bags, et cetera? Yeah, so this predator and perpetrator was not a high roller. 
for Vegas standards. I know he's been labeled that in the media, and, and some people have said that. I believe the truth is going to be this. Yeah, he got special privileges, probably from the floor that he rented, and he had been there in the past on regular occasions. But he well, wasn't the room a was high comped. Room. Wasn't it comped? Yes. Okay, so he got a large suite at the Mandalay Bay comped. Isn't well, Two. That doesn't make you a high roller? Two suites. Well, I, I guess that would depend on what you defined as a high roller. I think a high roller would generally be defined by how much they're gambling. I think that he probably had been there enough and um, asked for the room. He certainly was comp the second room. I'm not sure of the comp of the first room. I believe that that's out there and there is information that that is true. I can't confirm or deny that right now. Uh, we're going to get that evidence and discur- discovery how the room was paid for and whether it was comped. Uh, but whether he's a high roller or not, the truth is – People should not be given special privileges where somebody else could be harmed. I mean, I get that you want to cater to the people that come to your casino and spend a lot of money. I get that. You want to attract those people. But you can't attract those people to the detriment of others where safety is decreased. What about Paddock? Have you sued him? His we estate? Will, <clears throat> we will not be suing Paddock. Why not? So there well, – Of course, Jim, our position in this lawsuit is that Mandalay Bay, MGM, CSC, and Live Nation are responsible because they didn't provide proper safety measures. That's our lawsuit. That's the focus of our lawsuit. That's where we are trying to make changes in the world, in the United States, and make this a better, safer place. The defendants they're going to want to point the finger at Paddock. If they want to change the narrative and point the finger at Paddock, I'm not doing their job for them. I mean, I'm not hired by them. I got 1,500 people that were killed, injured, or harmed in some way that have hired me. I'm, they got plenty of lawyers. They got two monster law firms that are going to build the heck out of MGM, and they're going to do their job. I'm not doing it for them. But, well, but, but hold on. It, it's not debatable that Paddock was responsible for this. What's debatable is the level of responsibility of the, of the others. So why not go after Paddock? My understanding is apparently he has a $5 million estate approximately. So the logistics of that is that Mr. Paddock does not have a $5 million estate. He had quite a bit of debt related to it, but whatever it is, it's not going to be enough to make any difference for the people in this lawsuit if you spread it out over 22,000 people, it's just not going to be very helpful to the people involved as far as compensation. I will disagree with you on responsibility, but we can just table that. I don't believe Mr. Paddock uh, actions excuse the actions of these other defendants. But if they want to bring him into the lawsuit, they can. But let me be just super frank with you. Uh, Nevada has a piece of law that says, look, Plaintiffs in a case like this do not have to sue Mr. Paddock. And because he doesn't have to be sued, I don't have to sue him. And that's a legal strategy that I'm, of course, going to use to the benefit of my clients. I mean, hopefully my clients know they didn't hire a dumb lawyer. I'm going to know the law. I'm a Texas lawyer, but I handle cases everywhere. I'm going to know Nevada law, and I'm going to... Uh, use that law to the most favorable extent for my clients, and well, I don't. It's, ha- it's 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 called going after the deep pockets, right? Well, it doesn't really matter how deep the pockets are, does it? I mean, if MGM or Mandalay Bay or CSC or Live Nation are responsible here, they should be held responsible. How deep the pockets just simply means what am I going to pull out to make a difference? What am I going to pull out of those pockets to make sure that they do things differently in the future? The deeper the pockets, the more I got to pull out. And I'm not ashamed of that. I'm not ashamed of the fact that the one way we know in this country in civil litigation to make companies change over 200 years is to make them pay financially. If you don't make them pay financially, then they don't make any change. Now, if the federal government and state government makes a change and says, Mr. Pinkerton, we are now going to allow you to prosecute a criminal case within your civil case. And if you are able to prove beyond a reasonable doubt that they acted criminal, we'll put somebody in jail. I am happy to do it. I mean, I am happy. If somebody would go to jail for this from MGM, 
things would change immediately. Somebody with some initials after their name, like CEO or CFO or president or the guy that signed off on the fire report, okay? If that guy can go to jail, great. Change the law, and I will stop reaching him deep pockets. Do you think someone should go to jail over this? Heck, yeah, I do. Listen, who, who, if you, who should go to jail? Whoever didn't control the security at these defendants. You know, there's a lot of controversy about the timeline. The timeline changed at one point. Correct? Yeah, it, it did change. And then what we see is some vagueness in the final report. And well, but, but it, the most recent report shows Campos being shot after Paddock began shooting that, into the crowd. And that, that was a very significant change to the timeline. Absolutely was a significant change. I, I had not seen that or heard that and didn't see that coming before the report came out that's just going to be a part of our investigation how it happened but we know that he did stop to shoot down the hallway and we got to know when that delay was but it seems so so you believe but 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 you still believe even with the revised timeline that shows campos being shot after he started shooting into the crowd you still believe that campos after being shot delayed in some way his communication that he was shot well, I mean, it's in the police report. It's pretty vague about when he made that original call. What the police report says is it wasn't Campos that made the original call. It was the engineer that made the original call that was second on the scene. He was the one that called down to Mandalay Security. So that's a question to be answered. As far as what happened first, I mean, that's my job. I mean, did he start shooting first or did... He shoot down the hallway first. I mean, I'm not going to guess at it. I mean, I guess I can take the police report at face value, but there were 22,000 people at the venue at the time of this shooting. All of those people <clears throat> could have PTSD. A part of those people could have PTSD. I don't know how many of them continue to suffer emotionally, but if you are suffering emotionally, you have a claim. It's negligent infliction of emotional distress. The law says you can bring that claim. And here's what is important about those claims, and I think you touched on it, Jim, is that this gets worse over time. The number one killer of our military men and women that come home after being in combat and facing uh, warfare and bullets is suicide and PTSD. So we know that this is a serious issue and it needs to be addressed medically. And should the state of Nevada and the state of California, where most of these people were from, be responsible for that medical care? No, that future medical care that these people are gonna need for emotional stability and treatment should come from the defendants who caused it. PTSD diagnosis is simply some of the evidence that you can present. Certainly, if you're suffering from PTSD or similar related symptoms, you probably should go to the doctor and, and see what it is and get treatment. Here's the deal, though. We were at a country and western venue concert. Now, these are usually pretty tough-minded people that don't like to go to the doctor. And to tell these people, hey, you need to go to a counselor or a psychiatrist and get on medication... And they don't want to do that because what they've done all their life is rely on themselves. Um, this is not a gun case. It's not an ammunition case. That is not the story. I'm not trying to get the federal government to change the gun laws. This is not an NRA political gun ammunition case. This is a case about a failure, an absolute failure in security. I have been hired to attack that issue, and that's the issue that I'm going to attack. I'm sure the defendants are going to want to turn this into a gun case. And they can do that if they wish. And if they try to change the narrative to focus the blame elsewhere, they can do that. But my job is to make sure that the narrative is told to the jury that I believe is the truth and my clients believe that is the truth. What is in your head about what the why is? Why did this guy do what he did? And we have deranged individuals that do horrible and horrific things in our country. I have not seen anything in the record that would say that he was influenced by a third party like terrorist group. I do have a little bit of information that he had some mental health issues. There is information that he was on a losing streak. There's information over the past couple of years he'd become isolated and uh, isolate himself from friends, family members, and even his girlfriend. I, I don't know the answers to that. 
I'm sure we're going to find out a lot about Mr. Paddock. The truth is, I don't really care about that SOB. I mean, he's a disgusting human being, and he's dead, and I hope he's rotting in hell. The, what really matters is the people that he left behind, the people that he killed, the people that he shot, and that's the story that needs to be told. But we're going to find out about Mr. Paddock and what derangements he had to lead to him to do this. But the truth is, many times we don't know, right? We have cases like this that we never figure out the why and what was in somebody's mind. Jim, you and I are normal folks. We're not going to think about something like this. We would never dream of doing something like this. And to understand lunatics like this is difficult for us to process. Maybe we will find some information through social media contacts and email contacts that will come out later after this investigation is complete. You know, it's, he didn't leave uh, a suicide note. He didn't leave a manifesto. Um, sometimes that's very helpful to understand uh, a person's a mentality and why they do something. Sometimes they're just trying to prop themselves up and give them an excuse to hurt people because they're evil. But it would, it would be good to be able to answer that question because people want to know. I mean, they want to put it behind them. And the victims of this incident should be able to put it behind them. We want that for them because they are victims and they need to be able to move on with their lives. And it's very hard to move on without an answer. And I feel, I feel terribly for them.